Open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 3. Uh, this will be my last opportunity of preaching in the morning services, and I want to take a moment to uh, thank uh, Dr. Townsley, the administration of both the college uh, and the Christian school, for the privilege of being with you these three mornings. I so appreciate, and I'll say more about it in the service tonight, but I so appreciate the evident hand of God that is upon my dear friend, Dr. Townsley, and both the church and the college here in the Northeast. Now, there's a very short list of Bible colleges that I recommend. In fact, uh, <laughs> there's a longer list of colleges I do not recommend. But on that short list of Bible colleges that have my highest uh, and uh, humblest recommendation is this Bible college. And thank you, Dr. Townsley, for the privilege of preaching to your young people these last three mornings. I do not take it lightly, and I thank God for every opportunity that I'm afforded to try to uh, influence and impact the next generation. See, one day, if the Lord stays his coming, uh, I'll be in the invisible choir. And uh, one day, and I'm not being morbid, but uh, there'll be another pastor here at the Central Baptist Church. There'll be another college president. There'll be another Christian school administrator. Uh, someone will take uh, Dr. Brown's place. Someone will hold my meetings. And uh, the older I get, and uh, I don't think I'm knocking on the nursing home door, but the older I get, the more mindful I am that I want to do everything within my power to influence and impact the next generation for old-time religion. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 3, and I'll begin reading with verse number 13 through verse number 17, where we find the text of the message. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, beginning with verse number 13, <coughs> through verse number 17. And I would invite you to stand with me as I read the Word of God. I had made a mental note, and if uh, Dr. Brown, you could help me, sir, with this. As soon as I get done preaching, uh, after the invitation, I'd like, if it would be all right, to have all of the young people on the platform, uh, the college as well, <coughs> the college as well, I'd like to get a photograph, if that's all right, Dr. Soundsley, and uh, I just would... So appreciate that. So, Dr. Brown, if you could organize that, I mean, just as quick as we can, uh, just as soon as I get done preaching. Uh, I mean, I know you'll already be at the altar. I know you'll already be there, so it won't be a far trip uh, from the altar to the platform, and I want to get a quick picture. I'd be honored to do that. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, and I'll begin reading with verse number 13 through verse number 17, where we find the text to the message. I feel that I need to give you the backdrop of this message. A few uh, months ago, I was preaching uh, in uh, Chesapeake, Ohio. I was seated on the front row. There was a quartet that was singing. In a moment, I was to stand to preach. And as I was seated on that front row, I had already, of course, in my Bible an outline that I was going to attempt to preach. And just as that uh, quartet was getting about ready to hit the last stanza of that good song, the Lord seemed to say to my heart, uh-uh, uh-uh, about what I was about to preach. And so I just bowed my head and I simply said, Lord, I'll preach whatever you want me to preach, but you have to tell me what you want me to preach. I then took a pen from my pocket. I flipped over uh, the revival flyer and scratched out the outline that I'm going to try to preach this morning. It's a truth that up to that moment, I'd never preached before. I had never heard anyone else preach before. But a truth certainly that is found, I believe, on the pages of the Word of God. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, beginning with verse number 13 through verse number 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus, 
when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. Please look back with me at verse number 13. Gospel of Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now here's a verse that has what I call a A part and a B portion. It has an attic part. It has a basement portion. And I want to focus our heart's attention upon that a part, that attic portion. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John. And for a few moments, I want to speak to you on the subject this morning, what kind of preacher would Jesus still go here preach today? <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to stand behind a sacred desk to preach the Word of God. If I know my heart, I want to be a blessing. But the only way that I can be is if you hide me behind the cross and fill me with the Spirit. Place a hedge around this great church by the blood of Christ to keep the devil and his demons from hindering this service. Lord, I pray that in these moments we have with the college and Christian school that you'd speak to our hearts in a real and resonating way and that, Lord, you'd give us a truth that would not only help us this hour but that would help us the rest of our spiritual lives. Lord, for all that you'll do, we'll be very careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. And you may be seated. Much information can be both determined and decided by those who will and won't come to hear a minister when he stands in a pulpit to proclaim the word of God. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, we find the ministry of one of my favorite people on the pages of the New Testament, John the Baptist. Now this chapter could be easily or effortlessly outlined like this. The strange servant, verses 1 through 4. Uh, the successful service, verses 5 through 6. The striking sermon, verses 7 through 12. And then the submissive son, verses 13 through 17. It is well the Apostle Matthew is dealing under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the submissive Son that a person sees the travelogue of the Son of God to there uh, hear John the Baptist. Verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now, there are two things that are transpiring and taking place in Matthew 3, 13. There is what I call, Dr. Townsley, an obvious truth, and then there's what I call, secondly, a not-so-obvious truth. Now, the obvious truth is that Jesus is going to John to be baptized by John. That is the obvious truth. But then underneath the surface of that truth, I believe there's a not-so-obvious truth, and the not-so-obvious truth is Jesus is going, yes, to be baptized by John, but he's also going to hear John the Baptist preach. Now, from uh, Jordan, uh, rather from uh, Galilee to Jordan, it is some 60 to 70 miles. That uh, would take 17.5 hours for a person to walk. And the Bible says clearly in Matthew 3 and 13 uh, that uh, there uh, John uh, had Jesus travel from Galilee to Jordan to hear him preach. Now, if you need more support of that, look at verse 1 of this same chapter. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And so the obvious truth is Jesus went to be baptized by John. 
The not so obvious truth is that Jesus went to hear John preach. Now, I would challenge you. In fact, I'll split my love offering with you. That means I will tear it in half, the check, and give you one half, and I'll take the other. But I'll split the love offering with you if you show me in the New Testament three preachers that Jesus went to hear preach. Now, before you get excited and plan to do an all-day Bible study and Google it on your phone, let me tell you that this is the only preacher, the only preacher on the pages of the New Testament that Jesus ever went to hear preach. And there he traveled some 60 to 70 miles on foot, which would take, Dr. Townsley, 17.5 hours to be in a service to hear John the Baptist preach. Friend, you and I need to discover the type of preacher that Jesus would delightfully hear today. Now, looking into this chapter, there are three clear characteristics of the clergy that Christ would be in the crowd to hear today. Let's quickly uh, notice it this morning. What kind of preacher would Jesus still go to hear preach today? Number one, a strong preacher. Verse 2, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A clear characteristic of the clergy that Christ would be in the crowd to hear today is <clears throat> a strong preacher. In verse 2, the apostle Matthew tells us uh, about uh, uh, the preaching uh, of John the Baptist and how his message was one of repentance. Now this is not a vague general, a generality. This is a uh, laser-like message. He, he did not preach in the abstract. Uh, he did not preach uh, in a foggy light. He did not preach uh, uh, in a, an abstruse way, uh, but John the Baptist was a strong preacher, and he looked at that crowd, and he plainly said, Repent ye. John the Baptist was the kind of preacher that when you heard him preach, you knew he was talking to you. You didn't think he was preaching to a crowd uh, that was three or five or, or uh, oh, 600 miles away. When you heard John the Baptist preach, you were aware of the fact that he was talking to whoever was in the room. He was talking to whoever was on a pew. He was talking to you. And the kind of preacher that Jesus still would go here preach today is a strong preacher. A scriptural and serious truth, sermon if you will, can only be delivered by a stout heavenly mailman. The Bible says in Acts 2, 23, him uh, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching, and the sermon that he preaches is like the sermon that John the Baptist would preach. It was strong, and it resulted, may I remind you, in 3,000 people being saved, baptized, uh, and added to that early church. You see, if you were to look at the sermon uh, stack uh, of John the Baptist, uh, you would see that nobody had a better series on repentance than John the Baptist. Well, he had one sermon that was called Three Reasons Why You Ought to Repent. He had another sermon called Three Repercussions If You Don't Repent. He had another sermon entitled Why You Ought to Repent Right Now. He had another sermon entitled, What's Going to Happen If You Don't Repent Right Now? Somebody say amen right there. You see, the kind of preacher that Jesus still would go here preach today is a strong preacher. Back in the spring of this year, I was preaching in a Bible conference in Dallas, Texas. And after I preached Sunday morning, I was going out a side door, and a very sharply dressed young couple I'd say in their uh, early 30s, pulled on my coattail. I stopped and turned around and I said, how can I help you? And they said, well, Dr. Hamlin, we just wanted to make mention that uh, we are first-time visitors. This is the first time we've ever been to the Parkside Baptist Church. And uh, we just want to thank you for the message. And then they went on to say, mind you, first-time visitors in their early 30s, I, I guess that would be called uh, uh, millennials. And they said, we just want to thank you for the message. And they went on to say, Dr. Brown, we have been to four 
independent Baptist churches looking for a church, and this is the first church of four independent Baptist churches where the preacher got up and preached hard. And they looked at me and said, thank you. We so appreciate it. We've been trying to find a church where the preacher would just get up and tell the truth and just get up and preach uh, and just uh, uh, tell it like it is and we haven't been able to find one uh, in the Dallas Metroplex area and thank you, preacher, for preaching a strong message. I need to interject that I preached that morning oh, that little lady's Bible study when uh, the devil takes a title, reverend. You say, preacher, what are you saying? I'm trying to say that the kind of preacher that Jesus still would come here preach today is a strong preacher. Number two, let me hasten. Still in Matthew chapter 3, number two, a straight preacher. Please look at it, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. A clear characteristic of the clergy that Christ would be in the crowd to hear today is a straight preacher. In verse number 3, the apostle Matthew tells us uh, that John the Baptist uh, preached uh, gun barrel straight. I heard one of my heroes, Brother Boyle, Dr. Sammy Allen, when I was a young man, say that John the Baptist was a spiritual bulldozer. Oh, thank God for straight preachers. Thank God for preachers like Dr. Townsley uh, and Dr. Brown uh, uh, and others uh, of the same cut uh, and the same caliber that when you hear them preach, uh, you're not wondering what they said or what they mean. You know, America is in the shape she is this morning because the pulpit uh, has been weak and the pulpit has been crooked and the pulpit uh, has been soft. There's nothing wrong in America this hour but what could be made right by all old-fashioned, red-hot, spirit-filled Bible preaching. Now, leaving a Bible marker, in Matthew chapter number 3, I want us to take a moment and see the things that preachers in the present must be straight on like preachers in the past. Quickly, let's notice it. First of all, the message of salvation. Leaving a Bible marker in Matthew chapter 3, uh, please go with me to John 1 uh, and 29, a thing uh, that preachers in the present uh, must be straight on like preachers in the past is the message of salvation. John 1 uh, and uh, uh, 20, uh, 29. The next day seeth Jesus, or rather the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of of the world. You see a thing that preachers in the present must be straight on like preachers in the past is the message of salvation. Boy, just as soon as Jesus steps on the scene uh, and John the Baptist sees him, he there points to Jesus and he makes it clear that there is the message, there is the means, there is the method of salvation. Boy, I tell you what, preachers in the present must be like preachers in the past in that uh, we're straight on the message of salvation. Secondly, I know I'm going to get stuck here. The madness of society. Please look at Mark 6, 17 and 18. Mark 6, 17 and 18. A thing that preachers in the present must be straight on like preachers in the past is the madness of society. Mark 6, 17 and 18. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. The thing that preachers in the present must be straight on, like preachers in the past, is the madness of society. Now, I don't know what happens in your stomach when you look at Mark 6, 17, and 18, but I have to tell you, what happens in my stomach is it gets uneasy. 
And what happens, Dr. Townsley, in my stomach, when I see these two verses, I get uncomfortable. When I see these two verses and I think about what is transpiring here and what is taking place here uh, and the wickedness uh, of, uh, of Herod uh, and what was going on, I, I mean, I don't need a Tums. I, I, I need a whole roll of Tums. Now, can we fast forward to 2016? And when we fast forward to 2016, we discover that, friend, this, is all mo this pales in comparison to what's going on in this hour. And while I'm on that, let me go ahead and get on this. Any country's in trouble when it goes to the dogs. It's worse when it goes to the poodles. I'll wait and let you catch up. You see, what's going on here in this scene of Scripture, I, I mean, it, it causes my stomach to turn. It causes me to un be uncomfortable. It causes me to want not uh, one Tums, uh, but a whole roll of Tums. Uh, but when you fast forward to this very moment, friend, listen, this country has absolutely gone crazy. And this country uh, is drunk on sin. I remember as a young man, we talked about him on the way from the motel to the meeting. And Brother Roloff, I remember hearing him say that the inmates are running the asylum. I must confess to you, <clears throat> as a young man, I had no clue what that meant. But I believe that I've lived, Mrs. Townsley, to the day to know exactly uh, what Brother Roloff meant. Truly, uh, to the hundredth power, the inmates are running the asylum. Don't you ever get upset with this preacher when he preaches against the madness of society? Don't you, don't you ever get upset with that preacher back there when in a Bible college class he tells you that the trends of today are absolutely belched out of the belly of hell? Don't you get upset with him? Don't you get upset with a preacher like me that gets up and just goes ahead and let it rip tater chip uh, and it's on like Donkey Kong and kicks you down the hall and nails you to the wall and if you act like you're not paying attention, lights you up like a Christmas tree. That's encouraging. You see, the madness of society was something that preachers in the past were straight on and preachers in the present need to be straight on as well. Thirdly, the ministry of servants. Please look at John 3 and 30. A thing that preachers in the present need to be straight on, like preachers in the past, is the ministry of servants. John 3 and 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Oh, listen, a thing that preachers in the present must be straight on like preachers in the past is the ministry of servants. Man, you couldn't get around John without realizing it wasn't about John. Hello? You couldn't get around John the Baptist without realizing, man, this is all about Jesus and it's all about seeing people saved and it's all about seeing people get right with God and it's all about the kingdom of God and it's all about the church and it's all about fundamentalism and, and, and it has absolutely not one wit to do with me and you. Dr. Brown took me to the service last night and had a wonderful time of fellowship warm time of fellowship, and uh, as we were getting our meal, and there were a couple of college students that were there, I'm sure they're in the service this morning, fellows, are you here? They, they were in the restaurant last night, a couple of college students, thank you, sir, you and another fella, and we got to speak to them for a moment, of course, they didn't get our meal, say amen right there, sorry devils, but, but they were there, and they said hello, and I guess we appreciate that, but I uh, didn't offer a frosty. But anyhow, uh, while we were getting our meal, I watched as Dr. Brown uh, uh, reached into his pocket and, and pulled out of his pocket what every Christian should carry on their person all the time uh, and explained very simply the gospel to that young lady. She said, I've got a break coming, and I'll read it on my break. And she took that gospel track and stuck it in her apron. The Ministry of Servants. Oh, that every single individual that was in this service this morning 
would realize that the things that preachers in the present must be straight on like preachers in the past is the message of salvation, the madness of society, and the ministry of servants. In July of 1838, July 20th, the great preacher Christmas Evans died. Christmas Evans was used of God in a powerful way, and at his deathbed I have read where he influenced a number of young preachers. And those young preachers gathered around the deathbed of Christmas Evans, July 20th, 1838, looking for a bit of advice. I read where Christmas Evans at death's door and soon to cross over into the glory world with his last bit of remaining strength as those young men crowded around the deathbed of that giant for God with his last bit of remaining strength, Christmas Evans lifted his head from the pillow, looked at those young preachers around his bed, and said, the Boys, preach the blood that's in the basin. And then graduated to glory. With that one bit of advice, there at death's door before entering into heaven. Oh, Christmas Evans uh, wanted those young men to be sure uh, that they were straight uh, on the message of salvation. A straight preacher. And then number three, <coughs> number three and last of all, my time's gone, not only a strong preacher and a straight preacher, but number three and last of all, a standout preacher. Verse 4, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a, li living, a, leathern, a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. A clear characteristic uh, of the clergy Christ would be on the crowd for today is a standout preacher. In verse 4, uh, the apostle Matthew uh, uh, tells us, as we go back to Matthew uh, chapter number 3, uh, that a characteristic of the clergy that Christ would be in the crowd for today is a standout preacher. Now, standout means unusual. Standout means unique. Uh, Dr. Townsley took me Monday to uh, ESPN and Boy, I tell you what, I'm still reliving that experience. That was wonderful. And uh, in the lobby of the ESPN, one of the buildings before we started the tour, there was some memorabilia of standout sports personalities. They just didn't have anybody and everybody's stuff. I mean, you had to accomplish something. You, you had, to, had to have done something. You, you had, had to have set a record. You, you would have had to win a game or two. I mean, it just wasn't anybody and everybody uh, that was in that uh, area at the beginning of that tour uh, for, uh, uh, why well, they even had my high school basketball jersey. It didn't happen, but it's my story and I'm telling it. But uh, they had those uh, uh, memorabilia uh, of those that stood out in the sports world. Would you not agree with me this morning that John the Baptist stands out in the spiritual world? I mean, I don't know how many decades and how many centuries have passed from Matthew 3, 4, but don't you find it a little bit intriguing that all that time has gone by and all that time has elapsed and all that time has there, has, has there passed and we're still talking about John the Baptist, still preaching about John the Baptist, still saying, man, that John the Baptist, you know what? He was a standout preacher. Now watch this. He was a standout preacher because of his, uh, his dress. You see it in verse number 4, and nobody dressed like John. I mean, had a raiment of camel's hair and a leathern, a, a leathern girdle. And he, he stood out because of his dress. Right, we see uh, in, in our text that, uh, uh, verse 4 rather, we, we see that he, that he stood out in his, in his diet. You say, preacher, what do you mean he stood out in his diet? Well, well old John the Baptist, he, he ate salads, and his salads were locust salads with just honey grizzled on the top. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a, that is a standout diet. My brother, I believe that when you go hear John the Baptist preach, if he had a meal before the service, it wouldn't be unusual. As John the Baptist was preaching, a grasshopper leg was sticking out of his mouth, twitching. 
This is better than you're letting on. He was different in his dress. He stood out in his dress. He stood out in his diet. He stood out in his deportment. He stood out in his delivery. Here's something very interesting, intriguing, Dr. Townsley. When John the Baptist dies and Jesus is more visible in his earthly ministry, Herod thinks that it is John the Baptist come back from the dead. Now here's the connect that I make. Apparently Jesus, oh my, preached so much like John that Herod thought John's back. Oh my. John the Baptist stood out because of his delivery. He stood out because of his dress. And Christian, we ought to stand out from our dress as well. We should not look like we're escapees from the nudist colony. John the Baptist stood out in his dress. John the Baptist stood out in his diet. John the Baptist stood out in his deportment. John the Baptist stood out in his delivery. But here's what I really want to get to. John the Baptist stood out in his endowment of power. He had the power of God on him. Do you remember when Moses came down off of the mount? How many remember that story in the Bible? Moses came down off of the mount... And do you remember how that uh, the Bible says that uh, his face shone? And it's interesting, and I'll get to that in just a second. Moses didn't realize it. His face shone. So much so that the people said, Moses, you've got to cover your face. We, we can't stand before you because of your face and how it shines. And the Bible says that, that, that Moses, he... He, he got a handkerchief and covered himself. You see, power is detectable. Power is discerned. And what I like is, Moses didn't know it, but everybody else knew it. I don't think John the Baptist knew that he had the power of God, but everybody else knew. So much so that when he goes to heaven after he is martyred, his sermons still ring in the ears of that adulterer, Herod. Excuse me, America is not going to come back to God without the power of God. It's not going to be a powerless sermon. It's not going to be a powerless church. It's not going to be a powerless Christian. It's not going to be a powerless young person. If America is ever going to come back to God, it's going to have to be somebody and several somebodies that know what it is to have the touch, the breath, the power of God. Earlier this morning, I started my day, and I won't tell you all that's on my prayer list, but boy, you better know I prayed for Mrs. Hamlin. You, you better know that, uh, by the way, when I got here, I was unpacking my briefcase, and I, I, found a, I found a card from her. She had stuck in my briefcase. She knows my routine. She knows my ritual. She knows what I do when I get to the motel room and how that I'll unpack my briefcase and uh, take my Bible out. I'm going to need it in the meeting. Take my Bible out. Take the sermons out. She knows that. And so she stuck, sis, a card right where my sermons would be, knowing that I would get it. For 37 years, biggest cheerleader I've had is Mrs. Hamlin. Boy, folks are so good to me, Dr. Townsley. I mean, they, they take me to places like ESPN, and they buy me suits and ties, and I mean, they're so good to me. They feed me well like you have this week, and I appreciate that, and it's always a great encouragement. But you know what really encourages me? When someone's nice to Mrs. Hamlin. That's such an encouragement to me, because I know what an encouragement she is to me. So when others encourage her, that encourages me. Well, you better believe I prayed for her this morning. And then I prayed for our children. Then I prayed for our grandchildren. Man, they're awesome. They're awesome. And then I prayed for Dr. Townsley and Mrs. Townsley. And I prayed for Dr. and Mrs. Brown. And I prayed for the service this morning. And I prayed for the revival meeting tonight. And I rejoiced in the great meeting that we're having. And, 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 but you know what? There's not a day that passes. But when I pray for the power of God. 
And I dare say that outside of my wife and my family, there's nothing that I pray for, my meetings, nothing I pray for more than the power of God. I don't want to be just the whole home preacher. I don't want to be just the average preacher. I don't want to be just a ho-hum Christian. I don't want to be just the average Christian. But for God's glory uh, and, and for my good, man, I, I, want, I want to be the kind of Christian that stands out. I want to be the kind of preacher that stands out because in this dark day, we need somebody to stand out. I'm closing with this. There's an old mountain preacher that was in a revival meeting that every night in the revival meeting, two deaf people would come to be in the services. Now, the Central Baptist Church has a deaf ministry, and I've noticed that while I've been preaching, there's been a dear lady that has stood over here, and she's signed for me as I preach. But, but this church did not have a deaf ministry, and there was no one to sign, and every night those two deaf people came. And the evangelist, the mountain preacher, happened to notice that, and Every night when the invitation would start, they would, they would slip out before he, could, before he could get to them. So finally, at the last night of the meeting, <coughs> he told the, told the pastor, he said, now, as soon as I get done preaching, I'm going to give the invitation to you. He said, because I want to, I want to meet these deaf people, and I want to thank them for coming. And he said, I've got, to, I've got to ask them, why have you come when you haven't heard a single thing and we've not had anybody to interpret the services. And so the evangelist preached that night, the mountain preacher, and just as soon as he got done with the sermon, he turned the service over to the pastor and he shot back like an arrow because every night uh, those two deaf people, they, they would leave immediately and he had a, a note that he had already written uh, uh, on a three-by-five card and he slipped the note to the two deaf people and, and they looked at the note and they smiled and, and the note said, thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry we've not had anybody to interpret for you. But thank you for coming, and I must ask, you've not heard a word I've said, but you've come every night. Why? And the one deaf person reading the note smiled and nudged the other deaf person, pushed the note over them. They looked at it, smiled. They asked for a pen. The preacher gave them a pen, the mountain preacher, and they wrote something on the bottom of the note handed it back to the preacher. And the preacher looked at it and tears filled his eyes and the statement that they wrote simply said, no, we haven't heard what you've said, but we have felt the vibrations and we appreciate it. There is a heavenly, heavenly vibration. There is a heavenly effect. There is a heavenly movement that comes. When one has the touch, the breath, the power of God, which causes them to stand out above the rest. Please go back to Matthew chapter number 3. Two things going on here. The obvious, the not so obvious. Galilee to Jordan. Somebody tell me, how far is that? Yes, ma'am. Right? 17.5 hours. Close, close. That's good. Close. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Correct. And if, and of course we know Jesus walked it, so how long would that take? 17.5 hours. And what is the obvious reason, young people? What is the obvious reason? Let's get somebody from the college. They weren't paying attention, but let's get somebody from the college. Uh, what, what is the obvious reason that, uh, sir, what is the obvious reason that, that Jesus made that trip? Obvious truth. Yes, sir. The obvious reason. Baptized by John. That he gave it to you. The not so obvious reason, sir. Right. Thank you for doing it today. I got a flight to catch. I almost missed my flight. It took you so long to answer that. <laughs> the not so obvious reason was what? To hear John the Baptist preach. There we go. Good, 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 good. Five more minutes of recess. Way to go, buddy. <laughs> Jesus came to hear John the Baptist. The only, the only preacher in the four Gospels. 
that came to hear? John. Jesus was the only one. And, or John, rather. John, I'm teasing you. You ought to tease me. The only, the only preacher, Jesus, there we go, that Jesus came to hear preach. The only one was John. I preach all that, say this. Preach all that, say this. Sometimes we call a preacher, well, he's a fireball preacher. And sometimes we say, well, he's a, he's a teacher preacher. Or sometimes we'll say he's a conference preacher. And I know what that all means. But I think, Dr. Townsley, we miss it because there's another realm of preacher, and that is the kind Jesus would come here. And that's my goal. I want to be that kind of preacher that every time I preach, Jesus is there. That every time I preach, Jesus comes to hear. You can imagine preaching the way I do. It's not everybody's cup of tea. But that's okay. If Jesus would come hear me, that's all I care about. You can imagine that some might say, well, I'll never go hear Hamblin, but that's all right. If Jesus comes and hears me, that's all I'm interested in. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.